Hello everybody, I am Grace Contoc and today we are talking about electric inclusivity, exploring conversations for creative and digital equity. So I'm a psychotherapeutic counsellor, writer and researcher and here I'm drawing on my research with Bristol and Bath Digital Placemaking as an inclusion fellow. So we're going to look at how to draw on therapeutic research to develop inclusion for creative and digital spaces. Um, I'll share how we can increase um, the uh, possibility of equitable outcomes in painful conversations and how to successfully influence towards justice while keeping ourselves safe and advocating for change. I'm really glad you're joining me today. Thank you for spending this time with me um, and I just want to to acknowledge that not everything I say is going to apply to everybody. So I hope you find something that works for you that you can take away that's resonant. So please pick up what works for you and leave the rest. I trust you to find your part. Um, and as always, I am a therapist, but I am not your therapist. So if you need uh, mental health support, then I encourage you to reach out to get that, whether that is by Samaritans or your usual mental health provider because the issues we're talking about are going to touch on but not get graphic details of uh, inequitable experiences and uh, prejudice that can be experienced by many people, um, including ableism, racism, sexism, uh, transphobia, fatphobia, and other uh, prejudicial um, and harmful violent attitudes. So to begin, uh, first we're going to think about what happens when we start to approach a conversation around advocating for inclusion, for equity, equity in a digital or creative space. So often there is an issue or something that needs to be done or something that we want to be part of that we can't be a part of because there are structural barriers in the way. So what do we do? Maybe we try and figure out or we ask for um uh, let the people know that there are the barriers and say, can we do something about that, please? So that sometimes doesn't go as well as we might excuse me, hope. And what I had to learn to do was think um, through the fellowship about how we can assess and then develop appetite and aptitude. So the appetite is in whatever structure or organization or person that we're talking about, the appetite would be what is their appetite for inclusion? So some people, for example, might be really um, recognizing the need for inclusion. They might be very with that, um, but they have no idea how to do it. They don't really understand the process of it. Um, they're very confused by the mechanics and what that would actually even look like, but they are fully on board with that it needs to happen. So that would be good appetite. Now, the aptitude is, do the people have the capacity and the resources, both internally, interpersonally and externally, to actually undertake this progress and piece of work? So you may have somebody who, for example, has an appetite. They really think we need to make this change. This is inequitable. I've realised this. We need to sort this out. But they don't have any aptitude. So that might be that they, they um, can't tolerate any challenge. So they want things to be different, but they don't actually want to change anything. Um, or perhaps they want things to be different and they're aware they need to make shifts themselves, but they don't actually have access to any resources to help support those shifts. So they would say, you know, we can't hire any different staff or there isn't any budget for access needs. And so then that's not okay, but then they don't have the aptitude to do it. Sometimes, of course, these mix and match. So you have somebody who has the aptitude and the resources, but they don't have the appetite. They don't acknowledge how important this is. Or they have the appetite, but they don't have the aptitude. So what we're doing here is we're trying to use um, these principles um, based on psychotherapeutic principles to understand what's happening and how to navigate it, because it's never just us in the room. So we're drawing on these principles to um, think how we can best uh, navigate a situation when, for example, we meet somebody who has a discrepancy in their appetite and their, ap their aptitude or isn't where we need them to be. So what we can do about this. Let's think about um, drawing from my work on the anatomy of conversation that I'll come on to later. We might do an exercise where we think, what is the appetite and the aptitude 
of the people I'm working with now, the people I hope to work with. Let's pick something. Pick an institution, an organisation, a family, an individual, just for ourselves in our in our minds right now or on paper. And we can, um, you know, do this later as a practice, but just practice here for the day. So we're going to investigate the evidence. So let's look for evidence of what appetite and aptitude people have versus what they say. We might want to notice what happens in their behaviour quite a lot. And what can be useful in this is imagine that we're writing an investigative report to share with somebody who is going to check out this organisation. So you can imagine being a journalist or an investigator seeking the truth. And you have been asked, you know, you've been embedded in this, this place, and now you've been asked to write a report from your interactions with the organisation. Um, what was said but what did you notice about how it was said what were your impressions that you can't really justify or kind of explain but you have that sense that's, that's what you took away that was the vibe what tripped you up or didn't fit with how everything else was said to be what stuck with you or niggled at you during when you're there and after? And what was your felt sense of this space? How did your creativity respond, your body respond, your sense of yourself respond in that space? So just see if you can free write, just write. Um, you can dictate, you can think about this and just let the uh, pen, however you're doing it, keep moving, say for two minutes. And then when you finish, take a pause, and just read back over it and think, what impression is this giving? What is happening for this, this place? Where is the appetite and the aptitude? And what we're doing here is we're discerning. So these, the having discernment is really important, because particularly when we've been harmed, we often um, have our capacity to discern has been damaged. Because if you think about it in, in the Gestalt's work, the discernment is around, um, can be thought uh, as a metaphor of our teeth. So when we discern about something, we bite a piece off, chew it over, kind of taste it. What's this like? Maybe we swallow the bits that will feed us, that fit us. We spit out the pips or the pith or the bits that actually, I don't like that. That's not for me. But that's a process. And it's a process where we have to be able to say to ourselves, I I'm allowed to, I have the power, I can discern versus um, just once our boundaries are broken with trauma or with violence or with the multiple times that boundaries are broken, experiencing discrimination and violence and hate crime, um, we can lose touch with our capacity. Our capacity to access discernment has been impacted and harmed. And so it can be a huge part to reclaim this. And that's part of what therapeutic work can be about. But here today, we're just looking at um, how we discern about this uh, organisation or place of working that we're thinking about. And once we've done that, we may think about how do we work to the place where they, where, where they are now and get them to where we need them to be. Because quite often we can um, either push or tiptoe too much around appetites, um, but we still need to know where it starts because then we can protect ourselves. So how do we do that? If we know that the appetite is um, big, but the capacity is small um, and the aptitude is small, then what we can think about doing is um, it's maybe, and again, I just acknowledge we shouldn't have to do this later. We sh I shouldn't have to be telling you this, you shouldn't have to be listening to this, but as the way things stand, we are working to navigate difficult conversations for social justice. So we are having this conversation. I think it is still necessary. So we might think about how can we give them the information and support that they need to go and advocate for the resources that we need? How can we um, offer them uh, what we have that they might not know that they can then use to go and bring something back. If it's the appetite, for example, then we might think, how do we develop that appetite? That's a lot of that is work in the podcast, uh, which is electric inclusivity, which you can check out. So we've got a short time here today. Um, but that is something um, which we have to obviously assess with each person. But part of that is looking at what they find valuable so somebody might really not care about inclusion, and they should, but they might care about the reputational risk to their organisation. So we might then say, OK, so just checking. You're OK with this going out being um, exclusionary. So 
that's something that you're okay to stand behind and just checking that is that okay with your managers is that okay with your board of directions directors is that where the organizationals um the organizations uh stances at the moment um just checking that and actually people might then go oh actually I hadn't thought of that and then maybe we'll kind of be moved towards something so first when we know where they are we can then know where we are and the other important thing about that is to think of our capacity so we can look at that and think when we're doing this work how what capacity do we have to engage with it so very brief exercise for this we can think of what's on our plates so you may actually visualize or imagine or physically get plates or containers that um symbolize where you are or just notice as you think of them does a wobbly plate come up does a teeny little ball come up does a huge platter that's very empty come up in this exercise we're thinking about our capacity so what are our plates that we have to hold what's holding us and what are we holding so the idea with this is we think about three plates the first plate is what our capacity is so if you were a computer how much working memory do you have how full you are what are you holding today and this is knowing how much capacity we have when we arrive when we start something the next thing is the next plate is what am I holding? What have I got to hold for other people at the moment? And do I, how much, how full or otherwise is that plate? And the last plate is what are my resources? What are my resources and how full is that, capa is that capacity of resources? So having a little, just, we can do a mini check-in, just a little check-in before we start somewhere sometimes that or you can do a regular check-in where maybe you do it at the start of the month or before you begin a project. Where is my capacity? And then what do I need to do to work with that? So do I need to call in extra support? Do I need to resource at the capacity plate? Do I need to acknowledge that if I'm holding so much in my holding plate, I can't actually do as much at the moment in my own capacity plate? So as we navigate this, I just want to really honour that the environment impacts this for us. So if we don't have much on our capacity plate, I don't think that's just because, you know, we kind of need to be stronger or some nonsense. Um, of course, we may want to work with our own um, experience of strength. And I would, of course, support people's own journey in that. But as um, the psychotherapeutic uh, saying goes, we um, uh, there's... Uh, a quote which talks about how we don't make our internal weather alone. The environment impacts us. So if we are struggling and if we are feeling very under-resourced, that is not just on us, or, excuse me, that is not on us. We are part of a wider environment and ecosystem and we may be well be under-resourced for systemic reasons. So just really acknowledging that this isn't just about like do more self-care. This is about acknowledging that you may not have access to resources, you may not have access to what's needed, and instead, we just need to acknowledge where that is and then see what we can seek. But knowing the baseline is so important from going forward. So I hope that these have been of some use when we're thinking about how to advocate for inclusion, how to have conversations uh, about um, creativity and digital equity. You can find more on my anatomy of conversation on the Bristol and Bath Creative website and we will share details of that and you can also listen to my podcast electric electric inclusivity there too i just want to share that as creatives as technologists as developers as researchers we are resisting dismantling reimagining inventing and as kelly deal says we are the culture makers we can perpetuate or creatively challenge what is inequitable in digital design, creativity and delivery. I look forward to us building a just world. I look forward to building it with you and supporting you to do that without blame or burnout. So thank you for being here with me. You can join me at gracequantock.com, at grace underscore quantock on Twitter. And you can go to bit.ly forward slash trauma principles to download a copy of my three principles of trauma informed digital delivery. Uh, thank you for being here and being you. Thank you. And if I can do this, so let's see if I can, we, you can also go to this QR code. And if you put your phone up to the screen now and photograph it, you can download a copy 
of my trauma informed principles and you'll also get some wonderful updates so thank you enjoy have a wonderful conference and i look forward to seeing you on twitter and speaking to you very soon thank you